the purpose of the first presentation, and I can tell you when we organized the the conference, we didn't have any uh, indication that there would be Ukrainian Jews or non-Jews who might be needing to come to the state of Israel uh, for refuge. Um, it's an incredibly poignant segue into what I hope to convey to you. And I'll try and leave you with some enduring understandings, both for you personally and those that you can convey to your students. The goal, of course, all the time is when we do what we do is to help the individual teacher um, expand their own knowledge, but also make it easier for them to uh, communicate those ideas to their students. So I'm going to um, ask you all to uh, uh, take a moment and um, I'm going to share a screen. Um, I'm going to put up a PowerPoint. And I'm gonna ask you an initial question. So I'm gonna ask you all for a moment to think about the following. For context, when do you begin the story of modern Israel? And why does it matter? And if you would think about it, I'm not necessarily asking you to write down an answer in the chat, but how you answer this question goes a long way to determining how you tell Israel's story. And I'm going to just briefly give you two or three sentences for each one and why each one of them matters. If you start in the June 67 war, you're essentially starting the story based on how the war ended and maybe not even why the war began. And of course, those are two very different kinds of concepts to be conveyed to either a peer or to a student. If you start in 48, you are essentially saying the state of Israel came into being in 1948, and you'll give a reason, or you'll give several reasons. And when you start in 48, you'll talk about the 48 war, and you'll talk about the 50s and the 60s, and you'll bring yourself right down to the 67 war. And you'll talk about Israel's relationship with its Arab neighbors. But if you start in 67, you won't be talking about Israel's relationship with its Arab neighbors or the fact that it was considered illegitimate once it was established in 48. If you start with the Shoah, if you start with 39 to 45, and you say Israel came into being because of the Shoah, then what you're essentially saying is that Israel came into being because the Jews needed to have a safe haven. But if you say that, you might exclude the reality that Israel received a measure of international legitimacy before 1939. And that was when the Balfour Declaration was put into the League of Nations mandate. So if you started the Balfour Declaration, which called for the establishment of a national home for the Jewish people in Palestine, and it being clearly understood that nothing should be done which would prejudice the civil and religious rights of the non-Jewish communities, then you're essentially saying, I'm going to tell my students and my peers that there was a measure of legitimacy that was imparted to Jews to establish a national home because it was recognized by the League of Nations in 1922. Then you tell the story of 22, you tell the story of the 20s, 30s, from first partition, you tell the story of the Shoah, you tell the story of uh, immigration, you tell the story of land purchase. But if you only started 39 to 45, or you only start in 48, or you only start in June of 67, you're not providing a full length of context. Now, your politics may determine where you start. You may not want to start with anything except 67, because on your conscience, the only thing you believe that needs to be done is a two-state solution. So you will only see modern Israel in terms of Israel's relationship with the Palestinians. You won't see its relationship with the Arab world. You wouldn't see its relationship with the Shoah. You wouldn't see its relationship with the Balfour Declaration or the quest for legitimacy. If you start with failed emancipation in the 19th century, 18th and 19th century, then you're essentially saying, gee, the Jews couldn't do what they wanted 
in the 18th and 19th century. So they put up their hand and they said, we're not going to take it anymore. What we're going to try and do now is we're going to try and take destiny into our own hands. And the whole notion of Zionism, and notice I didn't even put it up here, because I believe without failed emancipation, you wouldn't have had Zionism in the modern sense, in the modern sense. Now I go back, if I want to start the story of the destruction of the Second Temple, now I have to tell the story of why was there a Second Temple and what happened to the Jews thereafter. What happened to them in the dispersion across the Mediterranean into Europe, from Izmir to Marrakesh to Tripoli, to Berlin, to London, to Spain, Portugal? I mean, my mother came from Germany. She came in the 1930s to this country. But we traced our family back to Portugal in 1496. And how did they get to Portugal in 1496? They were part of that dispersion that came after the destruction of the Second Temple. If you wish, you can very briefly start with Moses at Sinai. And I've chosen Moses at Sinai not because it's an exodus, but it's essentially the laws, and it's the ethics, and it's the values. My choice in teaching modern Israel, whether it be in college or in high school or to a scholar and resident weekend at some synagogue or some national Jewish institution, I always start with the origins of the Jewish people. Now, of course, it depends how much time you have to spend on any one of these topics. You may say, Ken, I really don't have time to go back to Moses at Sinai. You certainly have time for two sentences to talk about rules, regulations, concept of peoplehood, identity, values. If you do not do that, if you do not go back to before failed emancipation, what you are essentially telling your students and your peers that Israel only came into being because of what other people did to Jews, not what they identified as who they were and why they stayed together after the destruction of the Second Temple. They stayed together because they believed in community. They stayed together because of Morals and mores, Talmud, Mishnah, holidays, life cycle events. That's all part of the history of modern Israel because it's a history of who we are as a people. And this is a story. The story of modern Israel is a history of Jews as a people as they evolve into statehood. Their peoplehood becomes their nationhood and nation becomes state. And what I'm trying to emphasize to teachers, to educators, to my peers, to anyone who wants to talk about knowing the story of modern Israel, I think it's important to go back to the origins. And the origins are who we are, not just what others did to Jews. To be sure, pogroms, being blamed for the Black Death, for the Pope in the middle of the crusade saying, go get some Jews on your way to the Holy Land, for living in ghettos, for living under the rule of czars, dukes, princes, and kings in the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries. That taught us a lot about being community. It taught us a lot about self-governance. It taught us a lot about educating our own. It taught us a great deal about how we had to negotiate and lobby with people on the outside of the Jewish community in order to survive. Now, I did all of this summary in 10 minutes. I don't find any reason why any teacher, whether they have 45 minutes or they have five sessions of 45 minutes or they have 15 sessions of 45 minutes, why they cannot start the story where it truly begins. Because if you start the story only with the Shoah, you're negating all the activity and all the actions of Jews who took destiny into their own hands 
in the 18th and 19th century and said, I'm not going to take it anymore. If you start with the Shoah, what do you do with Alkali? What do you do with Kalisher? What do you do with Hess? What do you do with Nahum Sirkin? What do you do with Herzl and Nordau? It's where you start forces you to leave out what you don't include. Now, that sounds like a pretty convoluted sentence, but after 43 years of teaching at the university, I'm entitled to convolution. But I think you see my point. If you have any questions about I, what, what I just said, may I ask you please to put it into the chat? And I would be very glad to address it because this is a terribly important introduction, a preface for the story of the making of modern Israel. And I'm going to personally focus on the period from the 20s, 30s, and 40s, because that's where I spent most of my academic career is studying how the state came into being, what the British interaction was with the Arabs and the Jews in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. And I'm going to provide you with original source materials that you can use yourself or you can use with friends, if you wish. And that's all on the website. If I drop this chart in front of you, what do you see? What kind of analysis can you make? And what happened contemporaneously in the 1800s that would tell you something about Jewish identity and the change in Jewish sociology? For me, this is one of the most important diagrams or charts that I've put together. And why is that? Because what you see in the 1880s is that 80 plus percent of the Jewish population is living in non-democratic settings. Whereas in 2009, and if I updated this to the present, you'd find that 85% of world Jewry lives in democratic settings. So a major political sociological change that took place amongst Jews was their choice to move or to be in places where they could exercise choice. Zionism is the national liberation movement of Jews to move themselves from being the object in someone else's sentence to being the subject in their own sentence. I'll say it again, Zionism, is that move or movement of Jews to take destiny into their own hands and to be the subject in their own sentence and not the object in someone else's. That's what Zionism is. Zionism is by and large the term choice and self-determination. It's for Jews to intervene in history to personally make a difference, to say to themselves, again, <laughs> I'm not gonna take it anymore. I'm gonna do something about it. Now, what they did about it wasn't necessarily move to Eretz Yisrael and become immigrants in the first, second, or third Aliyot. Some of them decided, in fact, 96% of them decided not to go to Eretz Yisrael, not to go to Palestine. They decided to go to Boston, Washington, New York, Charleston, Cape Town, Perth, Singapore, wherever, where they could perhaps express themselves free from the violence of where they were living and free from their inability to gain civic equality in the countries in which they were living. Now we know. Failed emancipation didn't occur all over Europe at the same time and with the same degree in all locations. We know it was different. And you may want to spend time with your students and say, it wasn't this way in Germany in the 18th century, but it was this way, let's say, in Portugal in the 13th century. And we even know in the 19th century, failed emancipation was very different every time there was a new czar who came to power. One was really positive, engaging with the Jewish community, 
and the other absolutely used state-sponsored anti-Semitism to crush them in many pogroms. That was an up and down, up and down. When I say Zionism was an effort at Jewish national liberation, it was an effort to normalize the Jewish condition. And what does the normalization of the Jewish condition mean? To make it someplace between 45 and 55 percent of living and not being 10 percent being stomped on to 90 percent, I can get an education. Why do you suppose so many Jewish intellectuals and contributors to modern Zionism came out of the Ukraine in the 19th century? A couple of days ago, actually a week ago, I sat and tried to chart who were the famous Zionists who came out of the Ukraine. Prime ministers, presidents, Chaim Nachman Bialik, Yitzhak Ben Svi, Golda Meir, Vladimir Jabotinsky. I made a list of about 60 or 70. And why was that? Because the rulers of the Ukraine, mostly in the 1800s, allowed Jews to have access to education, and they allowed free thought. And that's why it was a very fertile environment for intellectual development. We also know, and this is my last point about this chart, that in the 1800s, Jews decided not only to change their geographic location, but they also decided to change the way they would practice as Jews. Reform Judaism, conservative Judaism, (laughs) Marxism, they're all evolutionary intellectual developments that come about in the 1800s. And Jews choose a new kind of way of expressing themselves. And there's great debate. I mean, the debate at the first Zionist Congress in 1897 is quite extraordinary. And if you're interested in the debate at the Zionist Congress, you just have to go to the store on the CIE website. And there is a pamphlet on a simulation for the first Zionist Congress. And you get a chance to see how varied the opinion was. Why is contemporary Israel so varied in terms of its ideology? Because it's always been. It's always been creating a big tent. Um, We do have one question. What about Jews from Islamic countries? Great question. So Jews from Islamic lands had a relatively easier kind of existence vis-a-vis their rulers in the last two or 300 years before the 20th century. They were a tolerated minority. Uh, They were known as Vimy, and they had a pay taxes. They at times were conscripted by whoever the local rulers were. But by and large, Jews who lived in Baghdad or Aleppo or Marrakesh or Izmir were duly tolerated. Their issues came later on in the 30s and 40s when Zionism evolved and local Arab leaders took out their anger against Jews and the Jewish state in the making on their local Jewish population. But there are two or three wonderful um, articles about Jews in Islamic lands, which I'll give you reference to in a moment. So this is my favorite series of photos, because it's 40 years apart. And you could start a class of seventh graders or start a class of 12th graders just with these two photographs. And it's essentially, where were Jews in 39 and where were they 40 years later in 78? Now, 40 years is not a lot of time in history. And the first one is the Zionist Congress of 39, Ben-Gurion's on the left, Weitzman's in the center, Eliezer Kaplan's on the right. This is Kaplan, Weitzman, Ben-Gurion. 39. No control over your own destiny, but you're seeking it. This is September 27th, 78. Perez, Alon, Iban, Simcha Ehrlich, Menachem Begin, Chaim Weitzman, Yigal Yadin, all debating should they or should they not accept the negotiated settlement with the Egyptians 
that came out of the Camp David Accords two weeks earlier. Now, that's a clear case of self-determination. The first one is a clear case of, oh boy, we're in trouble. We know about the Nuremberg Laws. We've heard about the stories of rounding up of Jews. We know about Kristallnacht. That happened November previously. They don't know, of course, yet what will happen in terms of the evolution of the final solution. But those are two very good photographs that describe the whole concept of taking destiny into your own hands. This is the Middle East in 1914. No states. Two ancient states, Iran, Persia, Egypt. And Jews could claim their connection to the land comes out of their daily prayer and comes out of the covenants. And those two items, by the way, Zion mentioned in daily prayer and the covenants are also on the CIE website. So again, a very broad overview, context. Before the 1840s, peoplehood, messianic dreams, partial emancipation, failed emancipation plus modern anti-Semitism. Jews seek choices. They intervene personally in their own history. They seek and they make a state between the 1840s and the 1940s. Their experience in the Jewish diaspora gives them several good lessons on how to manage themselves as a community and how to manage their relationship with the non-Jewish world. So Jews are experienced essentially in state building and state making because of their community activity and survival in the previous seven or 800 years of history. Jewish diaspora living were lessons learned for state building. And I think that's a very important concept because you just can't make a state automatically in 1945 because six million of your co-religionists perished. I can't go out and play basketball against LeBron James. I mean, I'm too small anyway and too old, but I can't do it unless I have some practice, unless I know how to shoot a basketball. You can't just, it just doesn't, doesn't automatically happen. And since context and content is so terribly important to me as a historian, you may even say that Ken's too much of a devotee toward it, but I would rather you be too devoted to it than not at all. From 22 to 49, Jews are making the state. They develop a measure of self-governance and autonomy under the British umbrella, but they don't have sovereignty. In 79, their sovereignty is recognized, and between 49 and 79, they had sovereignty without recognition, but only in 79 did Sadat give them the recognition. In other words, it's a gradual process, partial recognition. And let's remember, <laughs> Israel as a state is unfinished. It's going to be 75 years old in 2023. Where was the United States when it was 75 years old? I say 1776 and 73 or 74 years old. Uh, 1776 puts um, the United States around 1850. Where were we in 1850? We hadn't fought a civil war yet. Women didn't have the right to vote. We still had slavery. We didn't know what our borders were. I'm asking everyone to be a little patient because, like me, Israel's only 75. And I hope my grandkids think I'm unfinished. Well, maybe not, but I hope so. So this is where we get to taking a look at the website. What I'd like to do is just have you look at these titles and absorb the titles for a moment. The first one is a series of short paragraphs that focus on the intellectual origins of Zionism. And they focus on the socioeconomic background of what happened between the 1880s and the present. The second one, forming a nucleus for a Jewish state, and I'll go to it because the next two are the same, but in Spanish 
and in Hebrew. There you go. So this particular item, which is on the website, it's under maps. And the reason this is relevant is this shows you what partition looked like in 47. And this shows you what Jewish settlement was like until you got to 47. It's also in Spanish and Hebrew. And now I hope this comes up and you can see this. Yes. All right. So what we have here is we have a table that lets you enter any point from Jewish settlement, the Aliyot, all the way down until you get to the end of the mandate. What's special, I think, about it is because it will show you how, how the state evolved in terms of Jewish settlement and the Aliyot. And for each item that's mentioned, every item that's mentioned, you have a map, you have a prose, and if you want to go into one of the key documents, all you need to do is click onto it from the map, and it takes you to the key document, and it takes you to a prose introduction of the key document. So here is that first item. It's on the website, it's accessible, and you can use it for yourself for preparation in your classroom activities. You can use it for your own edification. You can use it for your students. And what it essentially is, it's essentially a series of entries, very condensed, about who Ahad Am was, and Herzl, and Nordau, Balfour Mandate. And here you go. I just want to spend, I know I've got uh, about seven minutes left. So this is 1926. The state of Israel didn't come into being because it was a gift. It came into being because of intelligent design. It didn't come into being because of the big boom theory. There was a Shoah, Jews died, the international community needed to do something to help the Jews. They therefore created the state. The partition resolution is passed in 47. Bing, bang, bong, you have the state of Israel. It didn't work that way. <laughs> it really didn't work that way. So here you have a Jewish land purchaser who's saying, I assume you all know how much land we can purchase in Eretz Israel in the next 10 years. What's the source? The Jewish National Fund meeting from 1926. And he tells you where they can purchase it and how much. Now you ask yourself the question, so what did the Arabs know and when did they know it? You know, that was John Dean's question of Richard Nixon when we went through the Watergate scandal. What did Richard Nixon know and when did he know it about the planned burglary at the Watergate? So I went and I went to the Hebrew University Library and I translated Arabic documents. And these are from Arab sources. These are Arabic sources. These aren't Zionist sources. This is from 1934. And an editorial is saying, the situation is unbearable. Our lands are now falling into the easy prey of the hands of the raiders. The brokers are increasing every day among various classes of rich and poor people who have been dazzled by the Zionist gold. Is it human that the covetous landowners should store capital to evict the peasant? The frightened Arab who fears for his future melts from fear when he imagines his offspring is homeless. Is it on our leaders' shoulders our calamity of land sale lies? They themselves, as well as their relatives, were guilty of selling lands to the Jews. And it said a British colonial office official, the Arab landowner need to be protected against himself. Now, you've probably heard stories that Jews bought lands from absentee landowners, that Palestinians didn't participate in it that there's no responsibility or culpability on the Palestinian shoulders. Well, there's plenty of culpability to go around for lots of people because history never shows that only one thing caused one event. It's multiple. And when you go through these sources, 
you get to see just how poor the Palestinian Arab peasant was. You get to see how bad decisions were made by Arab leaders. You get to see how Zionist leaders ask themselves, should they be buying land from poor peasants when the peasants are being evicted by their Arab landowners? There's a lot of self-questioning that goes on, a lot of debate on the philosophy of what the Zionists were doing. But I think it would be fair to say that when the Zionists confronted individuals who are willing to part with their patrimony, the Zionists said, well, if I'm going to take destiny into my own hands, maybe I need to buy some land that lies here between Kfar Vitkin, Emek Hefer, Herzliya in the south, and Khadera in the north. And that's what they did. That's what these maps are all about. That's what this story is about. It's a story is about how they did it. And the conclusion I hope you reach is a conclusion that essentially takes you to a view. Why did the Zionists succeed? And here, I've laid them all out that I see that I've condensed. I think they all contributed to the state existence, into its being. I don't think you can exclude any of them. I know it's complex, but that's what history is. History is complex. And here we tell the truth. We tell what we know from archives. We don't tell it from a political viewpoint. We don't tell it from a political viewpoint. We tell it from what the sources reveal to us. And when you look at the sources, students will feel there's an ownership to the story because they feel that they discovered it. They feel that they were not preached to. They feel that they were taught. And our duty and responsibilities, I believe as educators, are to teach kids how to think, teach kids how to analyze. And if we're teaching them the story of modern Israel, let them see the sources. Go to the website. Take the sources down. Probe it. Look at it. Evaluate it. And it takes you from the covenants and the mention of Zion and Jewish prayer all the way down to um, Bennett's speech given in February on what he saw for the Jewish state, what he saw for Israel in the coming years vis-a-vis -vis domestic and international relations. Thanks for the time. Thank you for your attention.